Что особенного можно сказать о новом, только что родившемся городе? This footage has not yet been released. It is now impossible to determine who shot this and when. The birth of the Soviet Union's pride, the city of Pripyat. It's accompanied by a narrative typical of those times. It ends by saying that Pripyat was lucky. Chernobyl became known worldwide shortly after the 1986 blast. But the little town with this name was situated some 15 kilometers away from the station and had a population of just about 10,000 people. Meanwhile, it is this place, some 3,000 meters from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which up to this day serves to remind about the extent of the tragedy. Pripyat. We take a walk along the streets of the ghost town in this documentary. The 1970s. The Soviet Union actively promoted peaceful atomic energy and launched massive nationwide building of nuclear power plants. One of the biggest projects of the time was a station near Chernobyl, a small town some 100 kilometers from Kiev. By the mid-1970s, Ukraine's first nuclear power station was already up and running, creating tens of thousands of jobs and a new residential area, Pripyat. In the Soviet Union, such cities were called Atomograd, or nuclear city. They accommodated the employees of local power plants, but Pripyat probably topped the list. Home to more than 50,000 people, most of whom worked at the Chernobyl station, it was regarded as the city of the future, almost a residential role model for the Soviet Union. On several occasions, Pripyat was awarded the best architecture and planning prize. But this communist paradise changed on one warm spring day, April the 26th, 1986, when an explosion destroyed the reactor of the nuclear power plant what was later described as history's biggest man-made disaster. Alexander Esaulov leads us up the stairs to what used to be his office. Back in the 1980s, he worked as the deputy head of the city's executive committee. In a nutshell, he stood next to the mayor. Alexander is the highest-ranking official of Pripyat, still alive. I was involved in city planning. All major projects passed through me. This used to be my office. I don't quite understand, though, who removed all the heaters from here and why, and who broke all of the windows. Do you feel sad about coming here? I was the youngest of all the officials in the region. Of course, those were my best years, and I enjoyed my work very much. It all ended very sadly and suddenly. While the destroyed reactor spread radiation everywhere, Pripyat continued with normal weekend life. Women took their children outdoors, weddings were held, and men fished in the river. For more than a day, the government kept the Chernobyl fallout a secret not only from residents, but also from the whole country and the rest of the world. As it was explained later, the authorities did not want to cause panic. This Ferris wheel and adjoining theme park have now become Pripyat's most popular landmark. But few actually know that it was meant to be launched on May the 1st, 1986. This was supposed to be a gift for the residents on the Labor Day holiday. Officially, the public had no chance to ride it. But photos published recently on the Internet have caused quite a stir. They show people queuing up at the park. 
Some suggested that the authorities launched the wheel on the day of the blast to take people's minds off what had happened. It's absolute rubbish. We didn't even have a thought about launching the theme park to keep people occupied. People in the town were calm. There was no panic. But what about those pictures? Well, I remember there was a test run of the Ferris wheel, and few actually went on it. But it definitely wasn't working on April the 26th. Within 36 hours of the blast, the evacuation of Pripyat kicked off. For years, many have lashed out at the authorities as to why the decision was taking so late, a question which still irritates Alexander, one of the organizers of the operation. Those who ask the question don't quite understand what it takes to evacuate as many as 50,000 people. You simply can't do it in one hour or in two hours. We brought 1,300 buses here from Kiev. We had to inform people, bring them together. And in the first place, we had to understand whether we actually needed the evacuation. Even specialists in the first stages didn't know whether the reactor was destroyed. The same power which created Pripyat, in the blink of an eye, turned it into a no-man's land. By sunset on April the 27th, the town had been completely evacuated, paving the way for a mass exodus from the whole area. Pripyat wasn't the only place to be abandoned forever. This only looks like just another hill. But in fact, I'm walking on what used to be a house. People used to live here. The village of Kopachi, right next to the nuclear power station, had to be buried underground, not to let the radiation spread. It still remains unclear how large the doses of radiation were during the period residents were exposed to the harmful rays. But clearly it was enough for thousands to permanently damage their health. Alexander Krutov, one of the first TV journalists to be allowed into the 30-kilometer exclusion zone, remembers the fear of an invisible threat. We were having a cup of tea at Pripyat a few days after the blast. When I saw a small mouse running across the floor, suddenly she fell over and continued moving on her front legs, as if her back legs were crippled. I asked one of the liquidators what had happened to her. He looked and said she'd had too much radiation. The impact on the environment was immense. A strip of forest next to Pripyat was burnt by a wave of radiation and turned red. Up until this very day, it remains an area with the highest level of radiation. This river here is also called Pripyat, and in fact it gave the town its name. Its beaches were once crowded but it seems to have the same fate. It has become the final destination, a graveyard for these ships. Many swam in the river before the fallout, many young men. The water was very pure. Pyotr Popov was among a huge army of people involved in the cleanup operation, and they were called liquidators. His crew faced a hard task, removing radioactive pieces of graphite from nearby rivers and cooling ponds. An unprecedented job in world history, as divers didn't have the training to work in such conditions. Our gear didn't protect us. It had a woolen inside. So no matter how hard you washed it, the radiation remained. The same story with our equipment. Divers don't care how they descend. But the conditions were hard. We all got a strong dose in the end. Residents of Pripyat managed to escape death. And for them it was better late than never. Many agree that the evacuation itself went very smoothly and quickly. 
more than 50,000 were put on buses and taken out within just several hours. Maybe it happened so quickly because the authorities had explained that it was just a temporary move. People barely had any time to pack their bags. And they were told they would return in just a couple of days. So most of them left their belongings in their flats. But nowadays it's only broken furniture and torn wallpaper which remain here. Just like the shattered glass all over the town, this is not a sign of it being left derelict. Over the years, Pripyat has become a mecca for marauders and vandals. This footage was recorded with a hidden camera a short while ago. Unidentified men are loading trucks with heating radiators. The town was left full of them. One cost just 10 US dollars on the black market. Tens of thousands have been taken out of Pripyat since it was evacuated. According to the liquidators, nothing like this took place two decades ago. There was a rule. Even if you saw a wallet full of money on the ground, you shouldn't take it. It meant it was contaminated and somebody dropped it on purpose. Nobody took anything. But those people who are selling on the dirty catch are hardly worrying about bits of steel, which could still be dangerous. Pripyat is thought to be relatively safe in terms of radiation, but for several dangerous spots. Like take this layer of moss on the ground, which acts like a radioactive sponge. You put the meter on it, and it goes crazy the next second. You can see it for yourself, 20, 30 times more than normal human level. It may seem to be something of a threat, but it has become one of the ghost town's tourist attractions. Something which gives the thousands who come here from across the world a thrill. Those who lust after a post-apocalyptic experience. Many want a souvenir from the ghost town. And in other cases, they want to leave something behind. Two decades passed since the fallout. And all of a sudden, strange, grim-looking figures appeared on the walls of the ghost city. Kostya Danilov was among a multinational team of graffiti artists from Russia, Belarus and Germany who visited Pripyat in 2005 on a special mission. On our way there, we thought we would draw our own concepts, something we usually draw in our cities. But when we went there and saw Pripyat, we changed our minds. I usually draw colorful, happy things. But the atmosphere changed my plans. This shadowy figure of a girl in Pripyat's tallest apartment building was his first work. For the first couple of hours I felt lost in the dead streets. I went into houses, deserted flats, I saw the elevator shaft and suddenly pictured this little girl pushing the button. I didn't think we were doing something bad. We went there and breathed a little bit of life into that dead sea. Kostya didn't know at the time that it was his first and last trip to the zone, as his team is now banned from entering it. What he saw as a noble cause, even though met thumbs up from many of his generation, did not find much appreciation from those who lived there. Do people draw pictures on tombstones? Do people steal iron crosses from graveyards? It is meant to be a memory. And I would say it's blasphemous to do something like this. A genuine depiction of an apocalypse. This is what the public sees Pripyat as now. But nevertheless, this dead town lives on with its own way of life. All these people have been in the spotlight. Who is it going to be today?
по-прежнему клюет великолепно грибов в лесу моря, ягод тоже. Я лично уверен, что атомная станция не испортит этой, этих природных условий. Decades after the forced exodus, the ghost town of Pripyat should be a depressing sight for those who used to live there. But Alexander Sirata has become a frequent visitor here. How often do you come here? More and more recently. We have many projects here. Many people want to visit Pripyat, and we provide assistance for them. Many want to know about their homes. Alexander was only 10 when he was among the 50,000 odd evacuees from Pripyat. In the last decade, his camera has clicked thousands of times in what used to be his hometown. He shoots empty buildings and the world's quietest streets. Every trip has a special meaning. You know, I don't come here just to take photos. It still feels like home. I spent my best childhood years here. I liked it here. And even those who have never been here before come and feel the calm. So they want to come back here. Tourism is tourism, of course, but what do you think attracts people to come here? People have different reasons. Some want to see what an apocalypse could look like. Some want to feel the history. For some it's their childhood, like the atmosphere of the Soviet Union has been preserved. But for me, it's more important not why they come here, but what effect it has on them. Nowhere else in the former Soviet Union can one see so many symbols of the long-gone giant in one place. And when it was alive, Pripyat was what the Soviet leadership wanted all of their cities to be like. But it was different in many respects. Most of its facilities were financed not from the state budget, but from separate sources allocated for the so-called restricted cities, where military and nuclear industry workers lived. These shopping trolleys were once filled with groceries. And like most of the Soviet Union, Pripyat never had any shortages in food supplies. Practically everything was available to its residents. And local stores like this one never saw long queues. The only place which was crowded, though, was this liquor store. Locals jokingly dubbed it as a mausoleum, probably meaning that there were as many men here as at Moscow's Red Square. The nationwide anti-alcohol campaign of the 1980s was barely felt in Pripyat. Vitaly Alexandrovich Leoninka, помните главу врач больницы? Признался, что медслужба города с самого начала была готова встретить во все оружие любые неожиданности. Любые. Но вот демографического взрыва не ждал никто. Строители города это застало врасплох. The birth rate in Pripyat was higher than all of Ukraine. If I remember correctly, the Republic's average coefficient was 17 per thousand. And we had more than 20. Pripyat was a young city with an average age of 26. People were given homes, and there was a great demand for a workforce in Chernobyl. So everyone worked and liked it there. Vitaly Leoninka ran Pripyat's hospital, one of the most advanced in the country at the time. Vitaly insists that Pripyat's level of medicine was so high that they managed to save the lives of many affected by radiation just hours after the blast. Our health care wasn't financed from the state health care budget. 
There was a special financing plan for cities like Pripyat. So we had the most advanced equipment. Our maternity homes even had video phones. A man could come and see his baby on a video phone. And that wasn't the only thing which Pripyat could boast about. It seemed that the best of the bunch came here, the strongest, the smartest, and the most talented. Alexander took us on the stage of what used to be a local theater. The rotten floorboards and crumbling walls pose a danger to visitors, so this site is no longer open to tourists. Alexander remembers Pripyat's drama classes. It seemed that half of the town was involved in cultural life. Here's a photo ban of our drama classes and young actors. And here's a photo of our troupe, which took part in the New Year setup. I'm sitting here. I have 1984 written on my hat. Some ask me why I didn't take it home. I say that if everyone takes their belongings, there would be no more memories of our lives here. Back in Kiev, Alexander shows the man who used to live in Pripyat some film footage he took in the city. Andrei Niverov was also a child when he had to leave. After 20 years, it appears to be hard to remember what his once humble abode looked like. What's this room? I don't remember. Oh, it's our children's room. Here's my sister's room. Here's the bathroom. Though I don't really remember what was in it, but I do remember the sofa in the living room. We bought it just a couple of days before the fallout. Alexander has become almost a prepared junkie, sharing the same views of the ghost town with other former residents. Eight years ago, he was involved with the launch of a dedicated website, prepared.com. Its popularity has grown rapidly over the years, especially after an address book project was created. A virtual prepit was created on the Internet so people could leave their contact details in the hope of finding other former residents. It's everyone's dream from Pripyat. After the fallout, fate spread us all across the world. And it became a big problem finding each other. Problem which hasn't been solved. It's an attempt to connect people who live in the US, France, Russia, Ukraine, Peru and elsewhere. Let friends and relatives find each other. And even if one person finds another, we know we've done a good thing. But the Pripyat.com project is not alone. Organizations like Zemlyaki or Countrymen also unite former residents of the exclusion zone. Most of them have financial difficulties and have to rely on sporadic donations, but they still manage to offer help to the thousands who suffered from the Chernobyl aftermath. Our initial task was to find relatives, friends and close people who lost each other after the evacuation. We sent letters, posted adverts, made phone calls. Nowadays our main task is to give psychological and health care assistance to the people of Chernobyl. 21 years on, most of them are suffering from various diseases, and we try to help them. The Chernobyl tragedy scattered people across the country. But a large part of the involuntary evacuees found themselves here. Just a year after the blast, workers from all of the Soviet Union built a substitute for Pripyat, the town of Slavutic. It became home to those involved in the cleanup, and also those who continued to work at the plant, until quite recently. In 2000, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was completely shut down. This was a small tragedy for our town. Over 1,500 families left Slavutic within a year, and we felt totally demoralized. Standing just 50 kilometers from the power station, the town is believed to be located in an area still affected by radiation. But the mayor of Slavutic assured us there was nothing to worry about. 
The town itself is totally clean. The surrounding environment is a different story. But the levels of radiation there are low and can't be classified as a risk to human health. Nevertheless, some 25,000 people still live and work in Slavutich. But with the Chernobyl nuclear power plant no longer being a source of reliable employment, it's unclear what the future is for Slavutich. The same goes for Pripyat. This ghost town is slowly decaying and starting to fall apart. A short while ago, school number one in the area half collapsed, by itself as eyewitnesses say. This has caused speculation as to whether the town is dangerous and should be closed down to the public, or as some say, even raised to the ground. But this is definitely not something that both Alexander Esaulov and Alexander Sirata have on their minds. Alexander Saulov writes books one after another, so people will never forget. While Alexander Sirata writes in defense of Pripyat on the website dedicated to the city. Those who in the 1980s called this nuclear city their home believe that it must remain intact for as long as possible, at least as a monument, to make the world realize the high price of human error.